I think we can get policy and perhaps an ETF backed by Bitcoin sometime in the first six months of 2023. That's why you got to be long now. You have, to, in my view, you want to be ahead of the market. They invited me to address all the legislators. It was a remarkable summit because they haven't had it for two and a half years because of COVID. So they had full attendance from all over. Every state was there. It was like a national convention, bipartisan, I might add, both red and blue states in full attendance. And they wanted me specifically to talk about the crypto market and the new digital economy that's emerging in America, a lot of direct consumer. And that was related a lot to data centers. And, and let me give you the two big headlines out of that conference. First of all, crypto and data centers are on the mind of every state. It's, it's gone from nowhere in their policy making to top of the agenda for a bunch of reasons. They're watching what's happening in DC with bills from Loomis and Haggerty and Toomey and the discussion on stable coins, all of that stuff. But the granddaddy asset is Bitcoin. And so what, you know, what, the, what they're asking is, okay, let's talk about bit. Let's just talk about Bitcoin mining, for example. So Bitcoin mining is controversial because of the ESG mandate and the concern about using too much coal fired electricity to mine that into coin. And I pointed out to them that there are states that have assets that allow you to do it on a clean basis and build data centers and states that don't. And so let's take the case of New York City. There was a big project going upstate New York about three years ago. It was going to be one of the world's largest clean data centers that was being built behind the meter, which means direct power from Niagara Falls. And money was put in the ground. I was an investor in that project. I pointed out to the legislature, I said, look what happened here. We brought in hundreds of millions of dollars to build this, one of the world's largest data centers, and as policy got wonky and unstable, and they started attacking Bitcoin miners, we simply moved it to Norway. With all the money, all the jobs, all the technology, all the opportunity, gone from New York City. At the same time, states like North Dakota, Governor Burgum, he said, hey, listen, why don't you bring that technology from Norway you got and bring it over here? We'll give you an opportunity to do a clean, giant Bitcoin mining slash data center. And that's what happened just last week. So there's have states and have not states. And I said, look, I'm just an investor chasing the path of least resistance. Some of you guys get it. Some of you guys don't get it. And the states that get it are going to get all the capital because you're talking about building 300 megawatt facility. That's $500 million. That's a lot of money. And you want those jobs in your state. That's the kind of conversation we were having, Bill, cooking right now, just on U.S. dollar and Treasury bill backed stablecoin. That was going to be heard in August. It's been pushed till after the holiday till September. The reason you would care about that vis-a-vis -vis Bitcoin would be if we could get that bill done, and, and let me give you the, the, the nitty gritty on that bill. It's not that complicated. Uh, the, the initiative started with the Toomey and Haggerty. They both had different bills. There's other bills, but it's all around the concept of this. Think about a money market, a Fidelity money market or a Schwab money market. There are rules about how those are built. They get audited every month and they're not allowed to own assets supporting the money market unit price that are, have a duration of longer than 12 months. Same thing for stablecoin. It'll be the same idea. Look, if you're gonna put out a coin and back it with US dollar, have a US dollar there. And if you're gonna use T-bills, disclose how many T-bills you have and what the duration is and let that be audited every month. Then we'd approve that. And the reason you got bipartisan support for something like that, think about well, let's pick one, USDC. That's the one that was the most stable during the crazy Luna situation when algorithmic didn't work and it cratered. Not USDC because it was backed by the US dollar. So let's just say those kind of, not just USDC, but any coin or any token or any payment system that's gonna be backed by a dollar sticks with those rules. That would be policy. And they're going to treat it the way they're going to try and get around the whole issue is, you know, USDC or Ether or Tether or any of these things. Are they coins? Are they payment systems? Whatever. They're going to look at it and say, we don't care. Let's call it a payment system no different than when you're transferring capital. It's going to be the same rules that we di dictated in a money market fund and then let the, the market compete. And so you're going to have different players with different amounts of T-bills, different amounts of cash. But the point is they would be, there'd be regulation for them. 
and the use of those as payment systems would become global and it would be backed by the US dollar. That supports the US dollar as the default currency of the earth. What politician, regardless of what side of the aisle, doesn't like that? And so that's the likely first step. When institutions see that happen, let's say we get lucky and it happens in September, that's when the focus goes to Bitcoin. That's when the granddaddy asset, the one that everybody wants, that'll be the next chip to fall. And I think that's when the big opportunity is going to happen. That's after the midterms, after November 8th, the House is probably going to switch. A lot of Republicans are pro-digital, pro-crypto, pro-Bitcoin. All of that action is going to happen in the back end of the year and early in Q1 of next year. I think we can get policy and perhaps an ETF backed by Bitcoin sometime in the first six months of 2023. That's why you got to be long now. You have, in my view, you want to be ahead of the market. Calling that asset, whatever we're going to call it, a commodity or a security, and we got that done. I don't care which direction it goes. Why wouldn't you be allocating to any portfolio a portion to Bitcoin? Just like you would for real estate, just like you would for stocks, just like you would for bonds. That would really change the dynamic on Bitcoin. And when that happens, you have to make a decision. Do you get ahead of that curve, not knowing when that actually is going to occur? Or do you wait until it occurs? Because it'll be, in terms of price appreciation, I believe it'll be dramatic. It'll be dramatic. You could have a gap up 10, 15, 20, 25 percent overnight because you've opened up trillions of dollars worth of access to a new asset class. That doesn't happen too often. And I think all of the productivity and all the people that are working on the blockchain and all the projects out there, and I always remind people, Bitcoin is not a coin, it's software. There's lots of really smart guys leaving colleges that are engineering and moving to the United Arab Emirates or the Caribbean islands. They don't stay stateside because they don't have any policy. So all that intellectual capital could come back stateside. There'll be a lot of things happening once we get policy, once we get regulation. And I think you're right. The timing is probably six, 12 months. But Katie, bar the doors when that happens. It's going to be really wild. Infrastructure, whether you go centralized or decentralized, is shit. It's just not good. And I'll tell you, I don't, don't mean, excuse my French, it is shit. And the reason I say that is it doesn't hook up to the existing compliant infrastructure for institutional investors. When they buy Bitcoin, it's very difficult for them to plug it in to their portfolio mandates because all of the other assets, the majority of them, get marked to market at 4.01 in the afternoon, New York time. That's not the case for Bitcoin. It just keeps trading 24 seven, as we all know. So if there's, there's a disconnect to the way that their own compliance departments say, well, how do I monitor this for 24 seven trading? If you're using leverage, for example, or you're not allowed to own more than 5% or you're not allowed to own more than 20%. There's all these rules by which institutions have to be compliant. So when I talk to these guys about, and the women who manage these funds, they say, look, I'd love to own some Bitcoin, but there's nowhere to fit it in. I don't have any infrastructure. The wallets aren't secure. You saw the Solana hack again. I mean, we got a lot of work to do as an industry to clean it up, whether you believe in the centralized or decentralized model. I don't care. I use them both myself. But I have to admit, like everybody else in the nascent days, I've been ripped off on a decentralized wallet till I got the joke on security. Now it's hard to do that to me. But you have to go through the learning curve, and a lot of institutions just want to plug and play. So you want that rapid adoption. Let's clean up the wallet system. I don't care, both centralized, decentralized, let institutions decide what they want to do. You know, I, we heard the announcement that BlackRock's working with Coinbase. That's not going to really change much because there's not many institutions that are going to use the fees that, that you know Coinbase has. They'll probably go to FTX or Binance to do that. But I'm not saying Coinbase won't give an institutional pricing, but it doesn't matter. There's no demand yet. We need to fix the compliance that you plug in, whatever register you've got, whatever wallet you've got, works right into your system. And that's the kind of stuff I'm working on. I mean, I talk to so many banks, so many institutions. It's always the same story. I call up compliance. I want to buy a million bucks with a Bitcoin. They just say, no, no, Nanette. I, I have to be realistic about what works and what doesn't. I truly believe, 100%, I tell regulators this too, Within a decade, crypto will be the 12th sector of the S&P 500. 
we have to realize that there's so much intellectual capital going into problem solving around payment systems, around tokenization, around NFTs, authenticating physical assets. There's so much going on that you got to be a student of it. You have to do it. You have to understand it. Otherwise, you're going to be left behind. I've got a whole team. A whole team in my operating company does nothing except crypto. We're looking around the world for new projects. I'm very fortunate. I get opportunities all the time. I'm a shareholder in FTX. I own a piece of Circle, Polygon, uh, HBAR, on and on and on. I'm in deep. I'm in, I'm in there. We're at 20% of our operating company's balance sheet in all kinds of crypto opportunities because I get the joke. I understand where it's going. Now, if you're not willing to take the time to educate yourself and build a team around you that can do the analysis, well, I think you'll be a loser. I I think you'll underperform the overall market. I think you'll miss out on this new nascent sector that's coming into the market. You've got to embrace it. You've got to understand it. You've got to learn by buying it, managing it, understanding the volatility, and watching it. That's how it works. I'm looking at it saying to myself, what discipline worked for me for 30 years in stocks and bonds and traditional assets? And that was the rule of diversification. And a lot of people say to me, I only need to own Bitcoin. I get that. That is the granddaddy asset, but it doesn't mean you can't own anything else. I think the opportunity is to get diversification and make sure that you have a plethora of different opportunities. I think crypto itself is a brand new sector. We talked about that earlier. So I'm a big believer in NFTs. I'm a big believer in the other projects, other payment systems. That's why I bought a piece of circle. I mean, it's sort of like give me diversification, but the asset that I want to get regulated first, it's got to be Bitcoin because that is the one that started the whole thing off and we've got to get policy around that. And that means as simply as allowing us in the US to have an ETF like they got in so many other places. Why are we so far behind on that? That means anybody could just, if they wanted to own some Bitcoin, could just buy the ETF, stick it in their online account, will pay no fees practically for owning it. That would be the right way to do it, to broaden the market to everybody. Everybody, everybody that's going to get involved in crypto, including my own kids and my extended family and all the people that call me. And, you know, I've got millions of social media followers always asking me questions about this. I say start small. Take a thousand bucks. Open up a decentralized wallet, maybe, maybe a MetaMask. Open up a, an account somewhere in a centralized wallet. Buy a little Bitcoin. Understand how it works. You don't have to break the bank. Do 100 bucks, whatever it is. Just start to engage in the platforms so you understand the strengths of centralized, the weaknesses of decentralized, and vice versa. Just get into it and start to learn. You don't have to go nuts, but what you learn in that process, just watching your phone, watching the pricing, understanding how you can take, you know, uh, fiat currency and, trans, and trans, transmit it into your account and then convert it to Bitcoin or go through stablecoin, whatever you want, and understand what gas fees are and all this stuff, because you're, you're learning about the 12th sector, the S&P. I tell people, don't just read about it or watch YouTube videos, do it yourself. Actually, take some dough, put it into a centralized, decentralized, and do it yourself. Nothing is better than that.